You are the sunshine of my life. Yeah. That's why I'll always be around. Oh, yeah, yeah. You are the apple of my eye. Uh, forever you'll stay in my heart. That's how much I love my History 102 students. I do know that, uh, you know, you probably... Maybe you've gone from the 20s to, you know, starting into the Great Depression videos. But I took almost a week where I wasn't doing this. I've been doing History 101. I'm just trying to get, you know, get this content on tape and upload it so you guys can have it. So I have to kind of re bring myself back to the, the, um, the general topic and attitudes for war. <laughs> I can't, I'm not doing whatever I'm trying to do here. Get back into the, the flow of History 102. So I hope you guys are all well. Uh, think about you all the time, of course. Um, wonder how you're doing. Check to see if you know people are watching the videos. And I see some of them. I see some of them have some pretty good view. It look like they've had the views. Or, uh, for History 101 or History 102, I gotta get close to like 130 views to have the entire class, all the classes. So I hope that you're, you know, watching these videos and keeping up the best you possibly can, doing your assignments and all those other kind of fun things. Okay, so one of the things that I described for you in the 1920s, of course, is the contradictory nature of the whole situation. And, you know, there was this era, this aura, if you will, of, of affluence, that everything was going so great, and um, Herbert Hoover will run on his amazing, um, amazing uh, campaign slogan, of course, of a, of a car in every garage and two chickens in every pot. But you know, as we know, that that's not exactly how the way that the 1920s are going to come to an end and what the 30s will be all about. One thing I find just so interesting is like the, the imagery of, of an era. So the imagery, the photographs, I guess is one way to say it, of the 1920s, they're always so kind of exuberant and kind of fun, you know? Even if it's like a negative thing, if it's like prohibition, it's kind of fun, you know, they're, they're breaking bottles or breaking into big cask of beer or something like that. But, you know, you got the flappers, you got the people in the 20s, you got people going to sports, you got, you know, pe people going to the speakeasies, dancing, Charleston, kicking up their heels. A tremendous kind of notion of exuberance that's happening as far as the 1920s are concerned. So you get, you know, this kind of light and bright and smiley faces that come to us from the photographs of the 1920s. But then we look at the photographs from the 1930s, and it's just so dramatically different, of course. And all the shades turn to shades of gray, and the sadness begins to manifest. And you see pictures of long lines of, of, of men and, and others, you know, bread lines. So they're trying to get some food or some guy standing, sitting there on the corner trying to sell an apple for a penny a piece. He bought it for a half, a half penny. He's going to try to sell them for a penny a piece, of course. One of the classic kind of images of the, the 1930s was, the, you know, we call it the Madonna of the Great Depression. Dorothea Lange was a great photographer during the 1930s, and she captured an image of a woman. And this was outside of Bakersfield in the 1930s in California. And uh, the woman is, you know, is just really framed upon mostly just her. But if you notice, there's like three kids that are kind of tucked into her. And, you know, if you pull back from that picture, you, you get to see these, the reality. Uh, and there's a tent where they're staying right over here. Or right over here is their Model T up on, up on blocks because they had to sell the wheels and the tires to make enough money to kind of survive. Her husband is away. We don't even know where her husband is necessarily, you know, and that kind of indication of the problem. And what you see in her face are these etched in lines of worry and concern, you know, how is she going to sustain her children? How is she going to feed them? You know, how are they just going to live, basically? And all of these become the images, of course, what, what is the Great Depression? And so the 20s will evolve, devolve into the Great Depression, into the greatest economic catastrophe in the history of, of, the, of the United States. Um, up till now, of course, you know, you always have to wonder, like, what's coming next? And indeed, if there ever is a depression that is worse, that'll become the Great Depression. We'll just call this one the Depression of the 1930s. Now, as you can imagine, the Depression was so horrific, with so much damage done, that it led to a, a generations, in some ways, of economists and historians trying to figure out what's going on, you know, what, es what did cause the Great Depression. And this becomes this existential kind of historical economic question, the causes of the Great Depression. Now, I have to tell you that there's quite a bit of controversy in, in, this, in this discussion and the conversation over this particular issue. And what I'm going to try to do is just give you everything I know. I mean, I'll put them all the pieces together. Everything that's been suggested becomes part of it. And I, I do believe that it has to be multi-causal. There has to be a lot of things that are going on that will bring us to this kind of a level of economic catastrophe. But I want to present to you as best I can the causes of the Great Depression. So the, well, the, the causational model that I always use involves structure and event. 
structures are the latent components that just are creating the environment in which we live in, in one way or the other. Uh, I don't know if I did this to you before, but you know, the structural foundation, of course, of the pandemic are the fact that we live in a, a massively populated world with all kinds of connections and very quick connections between areas, which allows for, of course, something like uh, a virus to begin to spread relatively quickly around the entire world. And, you know, so that, that just the fact that we live in a large world, multi and very connected world, of course, creates the, what we call the structural situation relative to the spread of any kind of a pandemic disease. You know, so that, that could be part of it. Now, the other thing that is always going into causation is event. An event is whatever happened, you know, that whoever cut into that bat meat or whatever they did, of course, that kind of unleashed this virus upon us, you know, that becomes the event. So the structures are the things you can see, you can know, you can do something about the events or stuff that usually you cannot, you can't anticipate, they simply happen. But as we look at the, the Great Depression, we, we see this model working, that there are structural flaws in the American economy that I want to highlight for you guys. And, you know, these create the latent situation. It's intriguing to me, you know, in some ways there were strengths within the American economy. And so it's always kind of a weird combination, you know, of the, of the structure and event. Hold one second. Patty, could you turn the heater off, please? <laughs> Sorry for bothering you. <laughs> anyway, it gets a little hot up in the, in the bonus room when we have the heater on. Anyway, um, there were some things about the economy that were strong. Now, you've got the automobile industry, the oil industry doing relatively well, but you know, I'm going to suggest to you there were other parts of the economy that weren't doing so well, and they, they create the foundation of some structural flaws that will lead us. And then the other thing that becomes a critical thing are that there are events you know, that occur, just things that kind of come out of the blue that will indeed ultimately you know, catapult slowly but surely the American economy, of course, into, its, in, in, into this Great Depression. So let me first of all tell you just about the structural flaws in the American economy. There's kind of two general set of structural flaws. Oh, by the way, and I, I should have said this at the very beginning, I'm going to post a PowerPoint presentation with this. Believe it or not, this is the one, the Great Depression is the one area that I, I presented in PowerPoint in my class. And I, my daughter and I put it together. It's actually a pretty good PowerPoint, I think. But, you know, I, I don't know how you, if you guys could do it. If you could run the, I, I, I tried to do a voiceover situation. It, it didn't, I couldn't make it work the way that it should have, of course. And you know, in some ways, I, I was uncomfortable with it, with it anyway. But uh, you do have the PowerPoint if you could like do a split screen where you've got me on the one screen and then the PowerPoint on the other one. The PowerPoint's uh, going to be loaded in the canvas for you. Then maybe that would work for you. You could do the clicks and try to make your way through the various slides. But anyway, um, the first thing that I want to suggest to you in terms of, of structural flaws that are leading to the Great Depression is the World War, is World War I. And the World War I, what, what World War I will do is it will cause all kinds of intriguing developments and, and dislocations as far as the American economy is concerned. So it, it played, it, it did a number on the American economy. I already I suggested that when I talked about World War I, that it maxed out the American economy. First time ever the American economy is maxed out. But, you know, in the dynamics of maxing out the economy, it's going to do some things, you know, that will become very troubling, at least as far as the uh, economic future is concerned. Now, one thing that, you know, this is a really complicated thing, but I want to at least highlight it for you to, uh, to some degree, is that it creates a flawed international economy. And the issue, I'm just going to do this quick because it's complicated, but let me just put it out there for you guys. One of the big issues of the war was the, the outcome of the war were the reparations. So Germany is going to have to pay, pay for, the, for the war, pay to the Allies, primarily the French and the British, pay, make payments in, in money and kind. Well, as you can imagine, the Germans, both, this was damaging to their economy, but they also didn't want to do it. And one thing it did was it led to all kinds of, you know, really problems in the, problems within the German economy, including the hyperinflation. And, I, you know, we have to look at this and say, on the one hand, it, it is because of the demands on the economy, but also, you know, the me internal mechanization. It's almost like, the, well, it's not almost like the Germans did want to sabotage this if they could. But you've heard of inflation, of course, where, you know, prices just jump up really high. But hyperinflation is when it gets bizarre, like when we're talking triple, quadruple, quintuple. You know, I can't even give you the parameters. I've, I've read them. I've presented them in my world history class. But, you know, like what, what used to be one mark, you know, was now going to be a, a billion marks or something, you know, just some ridiculous number. M you know, having to print money all the time in higher and higher denominations and just ruinous as far as the German economy was concerned in so many ways. And very damaging, for instance, to the middle class. Who It might inspire them to turn to more radical political expedients, like, you know, something like Nazism or something like that. Anyway, the Americans didn't like this, you know, it, here, so Germany's in problem, it's, it's troubling the entire global economy. So the Americans created these, these plans, I think one of them was, I think there was one, I can't remember if it was the Dawes plan, or that might be the name that was part of it. But these, these, these we, we gave money to the Germans so that the German economy would stabilize. 
and the Germans then use that money to pay the British and the French, and then the British and the French use that money to pay back the United States of America. So it's a circular flow of money, and you know, functional to some degree, but if, if anything stops the flow of that money, it, you know, it's going to bring everybody down. And this kind of shows the strength of the American economy, that when the Americans went into depression, into depression we dragged everyone with us. The entire world went into depression. And you know, it is catastrophic because you know, it, it increasingly radicalized our, an already problematic Germany and was the final straw that allowed for Hitler and the Nazis to begin to move into position of relative power. So you know, this flawed international economy has some dire consequences for the world, you know, if not necessarily for the United States. But I want to focus, ultimately, for the United States, too. Uh, what I want to focus on are more the domestic impacts of World War I. So here's one of them. The World War I tended to overextend economic areas of the American economy. And so this means that you know, these, these areas were a little too hot during the, during the uh, war and then had some problems associated with that. The classic example is agriculture. So during World War I, the American farmer never had it so good. It's like the best time ever for the American farmer. They could sell everything they could produce, and they could produce, you know, uh, they, could, they could sell everything they produce, sorry, and they could sell it at premium prices. So, you know, you just, you, it's, it's a great time for them. And the problem was, you know, it was great, wonderful for the farmers. They're selling everything they're uh, producing, and they're selling them at premium prices, you know, the highest prices they'd ever had. But they began to act as if this was the norm, you know, that this was a normal situation. So that meant that farmers who were selling everything at premium prices began to think to themselves, well, we should, you know, I should do better here, so I'm going to buy more land. You know? So they started to buy more land, and they went into debt to buy more land. And sometimes the land that they bought was more marginal, not, not as good as what they had before. And they bought more machinery, and they bought more equipment, and all these things cost money. And it was made on an assumption that they would have an in a continuing income flow you know, uh, from all of these, you know, all the, selling their crops at premium prices. And what they didn't take into account that this wasn't a normal situation. It was abnormal. It was momentary. And as soon as the war is over, the farmers find themselves without the marketplace that they had. In fact, they find themselves in a situation of glut. And indeed, the American farmer falls in, the American agriculture falls into depression almost immediately. By 1920, the American farmers are in depression. And so, you know, the farmers overextended themselves, and then they got themselves in dire circumstances. And it's really hard on the American farmers. They're going to be basically in a depressed state until 1939. You know, and tragically, the thing that will pull them out of them, of course, is World War II. You know, and it's going to need another war to drag them out of the depths of their funk, their economic funk at that time. So agriculture overextended and in trouble, a sick area of the economy during the 1920s. Now, the same thing happened to the coal industry. They overextended. They could sell all their coal. They could sell it at premium prices. So they start to extend their operations going into more, more marginal areas. Um, they buy new equipment, of course. And then when the war comes to an end, they're in the same situation. They're overextended. They have debts. They, the, the income is reduced significantly, of course. And coal, and, you know, coal isn't everywhere in America, but in Appalachian, the areas where it was, this is a big deal. And when the coal industry went south, of course, it's, it's going to be a, a, a drag upon the economy in a fairly serious way. Similarly, similarly, the railroads did it too. They overextended. They bought new rolling stock. You know, uh, they were carrying so much stuff during the war that they thought, "Well, this is great. Let's extend, expand." And yet, they found themselves overextended and finding themselves in difficulty. You guys know the railroads are a huge industry in America. Uh, you know, it's a massive component of our transfer, uh, our tra transportation logistics. So, when the railroads are hurting, of course, that's another kind of problematic component, another anchor that might drag down the economy a little bit. And then finally, and a little bit differently, I did want to mention that the textile industry was in trouble in the 1920s. And this is a different issue. This is more just kind of uh, becoming increasingly obsolete. Uh, the textile industry was America's first industry. It was located primarily in New England. By the time we get to this period, the, you know, the factories are too old. They're not keeping up with international factories. You know, so the textile industry, which was primarily in the area of New England, found itself in difficulty. Intriguingly, much of the textile industry will move from New England to like South Carolina or someplace else, of course, to regenerate itself. But here's another substantial regional economic problem that, you know, another kind of drag on the economy might cause some problems. So agriculture is in trouble, coal is in trouble, the railroads are in trouble, um, textile industries are in trouble. Now, there were other areas that were strong, like the automobiles and the oil industry, but, you know, those that weren't strong were problematic and with the potential, of course, to do damage. Agriculture is the largest part of the California economy, so if agriculture is not doing well in California, that's a big deal, right? 
So there were flaws associated with the World War I. It's going to cause some serious issues as far as the economy is concerned. Now, the 20s will continue the flaws. There are flaws associated uh, with the 1920s that I want to hide for you. And one of the central flaws of the 1920s, I'm going to call it government irresponsibility. Now, you know, this seems like it could be it's moral judgments upon the government or something like that, but I think this is an objective understanding of what's going on. The 1920s were a kind of a time of reaction, moving politically, moving against all the kind of progressivism of the progressive era. We have a series of three conservative Republican presidents in a row, you know, each one of them kind of vying for the other to be more laissez-faire in attitude and behavior as much as they possibly could. We start with Warren G. Harding. Warren G. Harding, I kind of told you, didn't seem like he even really wanted to be president, but his wife thought he should be it, and other cronies thought, you know. And, you know, he becomes president, but he spends his time primarily, you know, hanging around the White House, drinking beer, playing poker, having affairs and stuff like that, you know. And, you know, the only good news for Harding was that he, had, he died before the, all the scandals that were manifesting in his administration began to come into play. Like sale of oil, uh, U.S. government oil reserves and things like that, you know. Things that, you know, really showed that he, he wasn't being very attentive to any kind of situation. And he wasn't really paying any attention, of course, to the issues and the problems of, of the economy at that time. He was followed by Calvin Coolidge, often known as Silent Cal. Uh, one of his famous statements was that the, the business of government is business, and a big supporter of kind of a laissez-faire perspective, a big supporter of big business, willing to allow big business to kind of do what they wanted to do. One thing that I've read about uh, Calvin Coolidge, which I find interesting, was that it was said that he slept 13 hours a day, you know, I mean, a tremendous amount of time sleeping. Uh, I have no idea if that's you know, at night and naps, you know. Last time I slept 13 hours, I was in diapers. We're talking like three or four years ago. But no, not a good joke. Anyway, uh, those, the diapers are in the future for me, not in the past. Anyway, um, the, uh, these were both presidents were those who just, you know, really thought two things are going on here. Let's let big business do whatever they want to do. So we see a rise kind of in trust activity. We see the behaviors of the stock market, which I'm going to tell you about in just a little bit here. And then the other side was not to do anything about the problems. Every single year, Congress would pass a farm bill, something to help the farmers, because of course the farmers were a major political constituency. And yet every single year the presidents would veto it. They'd say, no, no laissez-faire, leave it alone. It's going to fix itself. You've you know, you got to hang in there for a little bit longer. Okay, So we have kind of a level of government irresponsibility where they're not really, not only not doing things, of course, but they're even promoting sort of problematic behaviors on the part of uh, big business. So it's just, uh, you know, we have sort of a, a, a laissez-faire, conservative Republican administrative situation going on uh, all through the 1920s. Now, the other major problem associated with the 1920s is the maldistribution of wealth. And this is such an interesting thing to talk about because it is the continuing issue of our world even to this day. You know, I think what we do, in, you know, we have a grotesquely maldistributed wealth as far as the world is concerned, of course. You've got you know, that 1% with, you know, huge holdings in terms of the world, approaching like 50% of the world's wealth, and then you've got 2 billion people who are living on $2 a day or something like that, you know, a huge chunk of the global population. In the United States, the maldistribution, of course, is doing significant damage to the middle class right now. It's one of the reasons that we have increased rate of suicide, increased rate of opiate addiction. You know, people are struggling so much. You know, it's so sad that they were already struggling even before the pandemic, of course. And this isn't going to help anything in terms of that. But you know, I, I admire capitalism because it's so amazing in creating wealth, but it's so problematic in distributing wealth. You know, it just becomes uh, one of the major issues, and it just seems I, I'm not quite sure how we overcome that, you know. I think that, you know, the kind of things that would be smart would be like free, higher public education for the people of the United States. That, that's at least one way of, you know, effectively redistributing wealth and also, of course, creating massive amounts of human capital in the process. You know, there, there's people who have ideas of free health care, you know, if we could do that. Those are things that would really up, we would manage the dist maldistribution. So many people, of course, who don't have enough money don't have good health care, too. And so they really struggle. So many things kind of come down upon them. Anyway, um, what we look to in history, regardless of my moralizing for our moment right now, you know, there are times when you see a relatively benign distribution of wealth. It's still going to be concentrated. It's always concentrated on capitalism. But other times when it seems more like the wealth you're making in the course and, and the rest are not do doing very well. And right now that's happening. That's been really happening for a long time. It, you know, I... I'm not a great student of this, but it seems like the period from like World War II to the 1970s was this period of massive expansion on the part of the middle class, you know, and, and relative wealth for the middle class, too. It was just good times, and it was a time of relatively high taxation, where 
the, gov the government made a social contract and where education was generally free or very cheap you know, for many Americans, you know. And then that shut down and after the 1970s, of course. We moved back to putting a tremendous amount of burden on the common people for, in so many ways, in health care, uh, education costs, etc. Anyway, the 20s seem to be one of these times where the rich are getting richer and the middle class is struggling you know, or not, not doing much better. Maybe little teeny gains in the 1920s. Now, you can function in maldistribution. I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the problems, right? It, it's functional. Poverty, you can live in poverty. That's the problem. You can live in poverty. Anyway, um, you know, in the 20s, there were jobs. In the 20s, there was installment buying. You could, you know, buy stuff that you couldn't afford necessarily. But in the 30s, when the jobs dry up, you know, and you can't, don't get credit, that's when we see the essential reality. And to me, this is the classic statement of maldistribution. In the 1930s, people starved to death in America. They starved to death. You all know that there's plenty of food for Americans. There's always enough food for Americans. So that's always going to be a distributional issue, right? We're not getting the food to the people. And if anyone's starving to death in America, then we know that there's a huge distributional issue. So anyway, one of the problems of the 20s was it seemed that this maldistribution uh, that began to become, you know, uh, increasingly problematic in terms of the well-being of the American economy. Now, into this flawed situation, by the way, I mean, they went through much of the 20s with much of the flaws kind of in, 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 in place, and nothing really happened, you know, in large part because, you know, people saw the strengths of the economy and didn't pay much attention to the weaknesses and so weren't necessarily concerned or worried about it. But into this flawed environment, in the latter part of the 1920s, come a series of events. So these are the things that come out of the blue that you cannot anticipate, you cannot expect, essentially, but can have ultimately catastrophic outcomes as far as anything is concerned, including, of course, the American economy. So the first thing I want to tell you about, and this is just a, a note in many ways, was a minor recession that occurred in 1928. Now, that recession was an inventory crisis. That simply means that the producers are producing their marketplace. And when they do that, they usually have to cut back an overhead. And when you cut back an overhead, you primarily cut back on your workers, you know. And it wasn't big, it wasn't huge, but it, you know, it, it maybe let people know that things aren't quite as rosy and quite, quite as wonderful as they might think it is. So the minor recession would be like that first little hint that maybe the economy isn't doing quite so well that you, that they th as they thought it was, okay? So at least, you know, in pushing them in the direction of, uh, of something more, something more is happening. But of course, you know, in the aftermath of that minor recession comes the real kind of critical event. And this event is what we call the precipitating event of the Great Depression. So that means what is the thing that started the whole thing moving in a very serious kind of way? And the thing that started it was the Great Crash of October of 1920, right? the Great Crash. And the Great Crash becomes for us a potential identification. Now, the Great Crash was not the Great Crash of st two steam locomotives running into each other. Though, if two steam locomotives did run into each other, you guys would have to admit that that was a great crash. And by the way, just this is the kind of dumb stuff that comes into my head, but at that time, they're transferring from the steam locomotives to the diesel locomotives. So they had a lot of expendable, disposable steam locomotives. And actually, as spectacles, they would sometimes crash them together. You know, I've got to tell you, I might pay money to see that. They, they'd have a portion of track, and they'd put up a grandstand. They'd have a, you know, one train coming from one way, uh, one locomotive, one locomotive coming from the other way, and the two of them would have to run into each other. I've always thought that that was an, it's an interesting kind of mathematical issue. You know, you have train A, train a, one train at point A, one train at point B. You want them to meet at point C in the middle. How do you make that happen? Of course, you know, for all the fans and. You know, I always wondered, like, sometimes it didn't work, you know, like, one of the trains was slower, so the train locomotive just goes by the grandstands, of course, nothing to see whatsoever, and then you hear it crashing in the distance, you know. It, clearly an indication that people should pay attention to their word problems when they're dealing with those in elementary school. But I'm not talking about the great crash of two steam locomotives, that, it, that would indeed would be a great crash. I'm talking about the great crash of the stock market in the 1920s, okay? And I'm sure you guys have heard about the great crash. Okay, the foundation for the Great uh, Crash was that simply the 20s were this remarkable bull market situation. So it's a, it's a time of a bull market. That means that the markets were going up and up and up. And I'm going to try to show this to you on my little whiteboard here because I can't think of any better way to kind of make this happen. So I hope you guys can see this all right. But I'm presenting to you the New York Times Index uh, in the 1920s. So the New York Times Index is an index of uh, the value of the stocks. 
I must admit that you know these value, these indexes are leave me a little bit cold. Uh, all I know, of course, is that you know there's a number there. When the number goes up, that means the average value of all stocks is going up. When the number goes down, that means the average value.